y'all, it's time for Rolling Dice and Taking Names. In this episode, the guys review Dawn of Ulos, 1212 Las Navas de Tolosa, and Archaea Society. Plus, a new Mountain Dew flavor means a new taste bud segment. This really makes me want to ask, Uday Uye Eats Bay Iggy Pay at my? Hello and welcome back to episode number 298 of Rolling Dice and Taking Names. This episode's title is Old Friends from Simon and Garfunkel. And I'm the first old friend, Tony. And I'm his second old friend, Marty. Are we just now at deep cuts on songs? I mean, have we ran out really of all the popular songs that people may actually know? Does it really matter? Does anybody really care what we call these things? I try to tie them into what we are talking about. Okay. All right. And we have a game on here that is an old friend. And we got a re-implement of it that we're going to talk about. So that's okay. the, the title. And also recently, I had the opportunity of going to someone who has just re- retired. He's my age. I, I went to high school with him and all, and he, well, quit tired. Instead of retired, he quit tired, which is, you know, okay. he quit 56 years old. He's tired of working. And you know him, by the way. Kip. Not Kip. It was Bill. I don't know if you remember okay. Bill, Bill, but he came over, he played APBA baseball with us over at the apartment. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, wow. I vaguely remember that. I know you vaguely remember that, but he remembered you. And I was like, I said, what are you going to do, Bill? What are huh? you going to do with yourself? Kind of like what you and I, what are we going to do with ourselves? I have no idea. Sure. And he said, you know what? My kids have no interest in my baseball card collection. I said, oh, uh-oh, really? He goes, yep. I am on eBay selling it. Now, Marty, Bill collected real baseball cards. Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking like the 80s and 90s stuff that we did thinking it was going to maintain its value. I guess 50, 60, 70 stuff. Yes. We're talking. Yes. He like his, uh, he bought his, uh, 1953 Mickey Mantle for $250. Any Mickey Mantle, anything is worth money. It's gold. It's gold. Yep. It's gold, Jerry. It's gold. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. You did a Seinfeld <laughs> reference. Because you... you That's ingra- a first on the show. It's a first. You've ingrained it in me, man. <laughs> the jar's round. The lid's round. Why not call it round team? I'm sorry. Okay, you're, now you've gone That's to... gold, Jerry. Gold. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I've actually seen that. Okay. So anyway, he, he sold it for $2,500. Oh, bravo. Bravo. He has sold... Of his collection, he has sold... Uh, he said, just 95 cards so far. I said, really? He says, yeah. And, I, and I've got about 100 of them getting ready to go on auction. I got these on auction. I said, okay, well, well, how's it going? So far, he's made $32,000. That's how you put somebody through college. <laughs> we invested in the wrong type of cards. Oh. Oh, good for him. I'm tempted if he had anything I was interested in, you know, like old red stuff. Uh, I'll ask him if he still has his... Pete Rose rookie. Oh uh, yeah, but that's going to be really expensive. This boy didn't play. He bought him. I mean, his Hank Aaron rookie. His hang any anything from the sixties. He picked up the rookies of most of Dang. them. I don't. Wow. I don't think he had a Roger Maris rookie. He had a few tobacco cards, and because um, he and I, you know, I bought one just because I could back when I was uh, fourteen. You got a tobacco card? I had one. It was of a no name, but I have it. Yes, I think. I know. That's from, uh, for people who are wondering what that is, that's from the early 1900s when they actually mm-hmm. used to pack tobacco pouches with a baseball card. Yeah. The, the, and the famous one, of course, is Honus Wagner. Yeah. So, and of course, the most expensive Mickey Mantle is the 1952 Mickey Mantle, his rookie year. Um, mm-hmm. So I was talking to Bill. I was like, man, so that, that is, that is awesome. So I'm going to get his eBay account just to follow a little bit and yeah. see what, it, what he's doing. And, and we were talking a little bit about the, the studs and you and I were talking a little bit about this red phenom. Ellie Dela Cruz. In fact, yes. my friend, you can look over my shoulder right there. The day he came up, I bought his rookie card. And it's already doubled in value. There you go. He did something uh, besides the triple steal, which was, ridiculous if you haven't gone out on youtube or wherever you watch your videos go check out his triple steal uh, he's done it twice i think it, unless he's done no, it he stole home time, he stole home twice that's what it he is. stole home twice but with the same batter so he got a single to get the tying run 
And then with the same bat up to plate, stole second, stole third. Pitcher, for some reason, turned his back to him and said, I'm going home. <laughs> it was amazing. So last night, I don't know if you saw this. So I follow Reds on uh, Cincinnati Reds on Twitter. He threw a ball, uh, threw a guy out at uh, first. He was playing third. And then they, they register everything now. He threw it 119 miles an Ooh. hour, which is the fastest throw across the field they've ever tracked uh, in history when they, since they've been mm-hmm. tracking this stuff. So he's fast. He's got an arm. He can hit. Just a phenom. And when I watch that video, I'm sitting here thinking, there's no way the third baseman is going to get to third when he stole third. There was no, I'm sitting there watching it. And one of my favorite people, I don't know if you, uh, I'm sure you do, John Boy Media. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I love some of his lip syncing and stuff like that. But anyway, I'm, I'm sitting there going, he should get on there and say, hey, why are you standing basically in left field? Here's the <laughs> fastest guy in major league. Do you honestly think that your 10 feet to get to third is going to beat his 90 feet? There is no freaking way. And for people who don't like sports ball, we have completely lost them. <laughs> That's it. They're done. Um, I, I will say this. You mentioned APBA. I steal Jones to get a set and sometimes sit and play a game with you sometime because it's been decades just to, just to play that and try that again. Yeah. Bill contacted me about 10 years ago. He said, I'm cleaning out. I see these APBA cards from you when you bought the set, when we lived together, uh, not me and Bill, but you and I in the apartment, I started wanted to start a season that never went anywhere. And I said, Bill, just go ahead and recycle them. I don't even know where mine are. Speaking of the Reds, so they had this big winning streak uh, going on that happened when I was down in uh, Florida, Daytona, uh, for the CEO gaming event. So my son, uh, all my sons are big Reds fans. So every day we were looking and seeing, because they had like a, uh, was a 12-game winning streak. Mm. Uh, the longest winning streak is going back to 1950-something. So it's happened during that time. So we was really enjoying that, keeping up, uh, up with that. But I was down uh, there. for This thing's called CEO Gaming. CEO stands for community something organi- organizer. It started out as a really small thing where somebody said, hey, I'm going to get some friends together, play some uh, fighting video games. Mm-hmm. And it's grown into this thing they do in Daytona every year. Thousands of people show up. They have a lot of major events. My sons wanted to go because it was the first year for Street Fighter VI. It just came out. They had their premiere event there. So they want to go play in the tournament. They didn't do well, but we had a great time. But I, I just thought it was really interesting walking around an event like that, which is mainly focused on video games and how friendly and stuff everybody is. We always talk about how friendly the board game community mm-hmm. is. I think I've just come to the thing is if you get a lot of people together who are passionate about something and you have a lot of interest in something, the community is going to be friendly. I don't think our community was any more friendly than the fighting game community. I mean, everybody was super nice there and very polite. The only big difference is Tony, the next youngest person I probably next oldest person I probably saw walking around that place was in his thirties. Mm. So I was really, really, really out of place <laughs> at this event as I was walking around to the vendors and everything and, and looking around. Um, at least at Gen Con and board game events, I always know I can go to the corner where they're playing historical war games mm-hmm. and know that I can probably find some people older than me over there at least. Or but to our corner where we may be playing spades or hearts or something like that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And even though it was mainly focused on video games, uh, uh, Solus Gaming was there. They're the company that does Pocket Paragons. Do you remember when we covered that? It was a, see if I can refresh your memory. It was a two-player card game. You had a fixed set of cards for each character, like seven or eight cards. And it was almost like rock, paper, scissors. We both play a card. One card would happen to be st- stronger than the other. You would compare and um, you could possibly deal damage. They have special abilities, and it goes in your discard pile. There's a card that you can play called Rest, which allows you to scoop up your discard pile and put it back into your hand. The trick was is there's this one auto-kill card Yes. where if you played the auto-kill card when the other person played Rest, it was an automatic win. So you didn't want to save your Rest until the very last card because somebody will know what that is. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I think it's, I played a demo of it again. I think it's a solid game. At San Diego Comic-Con, which just happened, they announced a big, big announcement about they're now going to be working with Image Comics. I believe it was Image Comics. Ooh. They have a new line of uh, comic books, and they're going to be featuring decks based on some of those characters. So they're going to be at Gen Con. I want to go and check out some of those uh, demo decks. Again, it is a quick five to eight minute two-player card game. Their first 
allotment of games, their first print sold out actually there at CEO. And so they're going to do a Kickstarter for a second printing. Oh, good for them. Yeah, I, I do. I vaguely remember that. But when you said the rest and the kit, yeah, I remember that. So, mm -hmm. all right. Oh, an image. Yeah, I can see some spawn action, some vindicator, some. So this is funny. I actually sent him an email before we recorded asking him, now, which one was it again? Okay. Maybe it was an image. It was, it was one of the independent ones, like an image, a valiant, somebody like valiant. that. Oh, man of war. Okay. No, <laughs> it wasn't a series of people I'd ever heard oh, of. It, okay. was like a new, it was like a new series new coming out from an independent company. But the, I saw the, some of the, he, said, he teased me with some of the art and everything. It looks, looks really good. So anyway, you can go now while we're recording it. It's not public information, but it will be by the time this comes out. So go check that out. Again, that's Solus Games, uh, Pocket Paragons. Now, sir. Sir. I was out that uh, week for gaming you and the other guys got together and played some games uh, while I was gone and you got to play something that I've been jonesing to play for years and you just couldn't wait on me until I got back. You went ahead and played it by yourself. But that's fine. Go ahead. Well, that's fine. Well, fine. Okay. So when I, so first off, when I kickstart something, you know, I'd like to eventually play it. And I know that with you, it's going to be, oh, well you, you know, you kickstarted it. We got this other game we need to play. Okay. Well, when can we get this to the table? We'll need to get this to the table. And I was like, well, he's gone and he's been gone for a couple of weeks now. He's going to go do this. He's got too many movies to go watch. He's got to go do this. So yeah. So we put on the table Thunder Road Vendetta from Restoration Games. And I mean, if you've been following us for a while, you know, in 2016, and the reason why I know this, this showed up on my Facebook memories today of when Ignacy, you, my son, you and I, and uh, Steve Avery, Steve Avery, all met in Atlanta and Steve Avery, not the pitcher, but the game designer. Right. Steve, thank you. Good point. And he brought out Thunder Road and I loved it. Yeah, I loved the simplicity of it. And we've talked about it and someone sent me a copy. And so I, I have the original. So I was very excited when restoration announced that they were going to redo this. And we've talked about how they made fun of me in the rule book about me being very happy. Aside from all that, we played the game and it is pretty close to what the original is with all the upgrades that you would want. So you're rolling more dice instead of the basic six, the D sixes that, you know, in the old game, you were only rolling three and you would assign them to the cars here. You're doing the same thing, but they have special meetings and you also have the ability to do uh, an a special action with your car. And one of those, of course, is to heal your car. And the same rules apply that if you're if somebody gets to the end of a board and your car's on the first board, they get all wiped away. Now, one of the things they did do is they provided more types of terrain. They've added some special effects to it, like rocks that you can be slammed into. There's mm -hmm. um, the slamming of people. You can be slammed off the course and destroyed. And it all comes down to whoever can cross the finish line first is the winner and the finish line is determined by whoever gets, if someone gets knocked out instead of prolonging the game, like the original did, mm -hmm. they basically said, here's the finish. When somebody gets okay. out, whoever crosses the finish line next wins the game. And so far I've yet to win. I've played it multiple times. Truth here. Donna did not like it. Okay. When she played, she didn't like it, but I know why, because the people who we played with were sitting there and teaming up against me. Because I'm the gamer. So they were going to take me out. Oh, gotcha. Instead yeah. Yeah, I guess you can. Well, in, in, in some aspects, you do have that, right? If there's a leader, you're going to try to gang up on that one leader. But I wasn't leading. Got it. Okay. They were, they were just, it was me being, you know, oh, we're going, because he's the gamer. And Donna was protecting her hubby. And, you, and she's no, going, no, oh, she oh, wasn't. Not my, she's not my man. Not my man. Uh -huh. mm, no, she that wasn't. She, she was out to win. I'm proud of her. Oh, okay. She's going to fend <laughs> for yourself. But I did like the aspect, like when you ram somebody, when you do yeah. that, slam somebody, that you roll the die, and there's a directional die that indicates which way they move. I really like that. And that was one of the new added things. I am so glad the helicopter's here, because the helicopter's yeah. important. And I like Did you make the noise? Uh, to the best of my ability. That's <laughs> the helicopter noise. Mm -hmm. yeah. We, and then when Mark and Bert and I played, we had a big time with it so much. So Mark went out and got him a copy. Nice. And, but I just, I just have the base set of it. The, um, what is it? The shading on the models is incredible and it, top notch production, of course, from restoration. 
So if we ever get an opportunity to play for, you know, a 30 minute filler, I'll keep it in the car and maybe you can play it as well and see what you think. That's what I was going to ask. I thought it was a longer game. It can be. Every game I've played has been 45 minutes. Okay. Okay. And it's been, it comes down to basically as long as people aren't being nice. This is not a game. Vanessa cannot play this game because you got to be mean. You got to be mean. For some reason, I was hearing 90 minute games. That kind of scared me away. It, it can be if you can't get somebody eliminated. Okay. Okay. I mean, if you're going to race all your cars and keep just racing cars and not trying to eliminate people, and it can't bite you in the butt, you can eliminate yourself based on some of the rules that are in there. And then there's special cards that you can add into the game. But yeah, I can see where it would last 90 minutes if people were not vindictive or not trying to hold a vendetta against someone else. It can, oh, nice tie in. It's very mm-hmm. important that you do that, that you start trying to take people out and maybe you two of your cars to take out everybody else and let one run ahead. There's multiple strategies. There's a nice hidden tile aspect of going over it. Some rules about being able to speed up on the road. They kept that in there. Uh, it was really good. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And I will say if you are going to play with people that are nice, who don't like using the um, thief and Catan, then this is not a game for them. Yeah. I want to play. So yeah, leave it in the car. Uh, I want to experience the the new version we played i played it a prototype of it mm. um but now to play this finished version i think would be really cool so yeah and, and they really did i went back and read the rules i mean they've did some big overhauls but it wasn't it, it didn't take the flavor of the game away right right so once again you know davio didn't screw it up he didn't you know he, he actually made it work so he he didn't overcomplicate it. he didn't overcomplicate it he made it easier for people to understand and the boards are you know magnificent so Good, okay. good for them. I, I will say this, that, you know, if I had a car like that, so it's been dry here. I, you know, I got to be careful going out on the lawn when I'm backing out because I'm an old man and sometimes I go a little too far and I hit my lawn and it's all crinkly and the grass is drying up. I don't know how yours is doing, but I don't, do you water yours? Um, I would if I didn't have a uh, PVC uh, issue with my sprinkler system at the, at the, uh, backflow valve, uh-huh. I've got a leak, leaky coupling. Uh-huh. A- and, uh, so I have it turned off right now. I haven't gone out there to try to replace it. I can't decide whether I want to try to replace it myself or call somebody. Well, I am your man to tell you what you may want to do. Okay. So I went and turned on my sprinklers, uh, this past weekend. And as I was valving them in, because I had winterized it, I noticed that there was suddenly a jet of water coming out of one of the isolation valves on the side housing. I'm Mm -hmm. like, that's not good. (laughs) And then the other isolation valve on the downstream of the check valve, I started valving it just to see what, and suddenly a stream of water was shooting out of its housing. So I called a long guy, called a landscaping guy, I called a bunch of people to see who come out. Only one showed up, of course. And I was like, okay, so what's happening? He says, well, sir, your system's old and they don't make these types of valves anymore. And so we will have, in order to replace these two valve housings or these two valves, we're going to have to put in two new ones. So your pipes are not at the right spacing. And by the way, in order to fit this check valve, we need the original valves. And I was looking in, cause I've been looking into this, see if I could do it. And I couldn't find the valves. I could not find the isolation valve. He said, so we're just going to have to cut the pipes off. And so, you know, just get your wallet out and just, just, just give me, um, $750. Sheesh. Cause we've got to, we've got to weld the pipes. We've got to do this. You need a new check valve. You need new isolation valves just because those two housings. And I look at him and go, do you think flex seal would work? And he started laughing at me. He says, no, the pressure's too much on these things. There's no way. Hey, it, before you do it, it wouldn't hurt to try it, would it? I've already scheduled it. Wouldn't it wouldn't hurt. I've already scheduled because I know if it starts to leak, I won't go out there to check and suddenly I'm going to have a $500 water bill. Well, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. So, yeah, so I have the, the backflow valve out of my supply. It was like, the, <laughs> Vanessa was like, is it supposed to be wet <laughs> near the well? Don't you hate that? And I said, I'm freaking out. I mean, wet and well is not good. 
So I go out there and I was like, holy crap, it is like sopping wet out here. So I took the cover, I have a well, y'all. So I took the cover off the well, not leaking there. And it's like, oh, it's bubbling out from the the cover where the uh, the backflow valve is for the um, Mm -hmm. uh, irrigation system. So I took the cover off. It's just full of water. So I shut off the supply, went and got my uh, wet vac, basically (laughs) sucked it and blew all the water out so I could see what was going on, turned it back on. So yeah, it looks like a PVC coupling is just spewing water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not the valve itself. I think it's just the coupling. Coupling. Of course, I asked my dad, he said, you could do that. Do it. Do it. Just do it. So I don't know. I'm going to go out there and look at it again. Had to wait for it to really dry up before I attempt it, but I'll see. I don't know. Well, that's what my uncle told me. He said, uh, I sent him the pictures of it and he goes, you can do it if you can find those valves because other than that, you got to do plumbing. So, so my different thing is it's not a valve. It's just, it's just a pipe. I think it's the coupling on the, the PVC yeah. pipe. So anyway, yeah. Uh, lawn care sucks, man. It's, um, it's not fun owning a, uh, so yeah, my yard is dry too. Okay. Well, besides adulting, did you get to do any fun games while I was gone while I was in DC? So while you were gone, you know, I'm on this kick of replaying older games. There was a game that came out in 2000 called the princess princes of Florence from a Wolfgang Kramer, Richard Urick, and Jans Christopher Urick. Uh, it's a two to five player game. Hasn't been in print for a very long time. Whiz Kids just reprinted the game, got the art redone and everything. It looks really good. So I was interested in seeing as a game that's 23 years old, mm-hmm. does it stand the test of time? And I love it when these old games come back and it doesn't feel like a 23 year old game. Uh, recently, we played Siliconvania. Yes. And that game, each of you had a board where you're trying to put tiles on your board and score points. It's very similar to that. Oh. I told, I told you, I said, hey, we're playing a polyomino game. It's like, play it because I know you say you don't like that. Uh, but each of us have a board <laughs> and we're trying to build out like a, a little a, a district with some parks and some buildings to attract artists. That's the theme of it. But like in Siliconvania, the very first thing we do, there's an auction phase. So what we're doing is we're bidding on things that we can use, like additional workers, which makes it cheaper to buy uh, buildings, or uh, you can put buildings adjacent to each other, which you normally can't do, or these things called jesters, uh, which artists like to have around, which makes them, which ends up giving you more money if you got jesters hanging around, or nice little things like parks or forests, which likes to draw people. So you're going to bid on these things, but what's cool is, Once somebody takes a particular item, like a gesture or a park or a a resource card, that is locked for the rest of the round. Mm. So nobody else can buy one of those. So the bidding is fun. Not only do you want to get what you want, you want to keep somebody else from locking you out of it. Or you need to lock somebody else out, which we didn't do with Bert, who had gestures and and really did well. So anyway, (laughs) there's a bidding phase. And then on your turn, you're going to take two actions. You can buy a building. Uh, you're going to have these artists that you're trying to complete jobs. And you'll play an artist card and it says, hey, I want to be in a district that has a park. I want something that has this building. And you're, it's a little checklist of things. And you get X amount of points for each one that you have completed. All the, for every point that you earn, you get that much money back. That money is used in the bidding. That money is used for buying buildings. And also, every round that you play, you play through seven rounds. Uh, every round that you play, when you complete a job, it's called completing a job, you have to satisfy the artist even more. So like the first round, you only need three points worth of value. Next round, you may need five. Next round, you may need seven. Because as you build out your stuff, you have have more things to appease the person. I really liked it because typically in these type of uh, games where you're using polyominoes, a building thing on your board, it's very solitaire because it adds in the auction. There's an element of, okay, you're head to head fighting for these things. Then you're kind of doing your own thing. But we found out that you only get 14 turns in a game and it's not enough. Mm. I love games where I feel like I really need an extra turn per round to really get into this. And it makes me want more. And that's exactly what this game did. Okay. Is it doing any, is it really doing a lot different? No, I just mentioned Silicon Valley. I was comparing it to it, but it's a very solid game. Easy to understand. I like games where 
the things that uh, you're trying to get the most money or the most points to win, but those points are converted. You can convert some of those points back into money, et cetera. So the resource management is kind of interesting. I really enjoyed it. We played it probably in about 60 minutes. It went quick with three people, mm -hmm. hardly any downtime because when it comes to your turn and you're taking your two actions, it's, it's lickety split. Nobody can really block you from doing anything. You could do anything you want to do during that phase. So you can think about what you want to do when it gets back to you. I liked it. Okay. I, I'm glad it was gets brought back. Now, and it's funny when you say it doesn't do anything new. Well, it did it first. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you. Yeah. So that's why it felt so, that's, I, it didn't feel like it was 23 years old. It's like a mixture of bidding. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, polyominoes were, were hot recently, right? Everybody's doing that sort oh, of thing. Oh, yeah. Well, this is something that did it 23 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking over at BGG about this. And now I did like my city, which is the similar type of feel to it with the placing the Tetris pieces. I didn't, I'm not good at these games. It's not that I don't like them. I'm just not good at them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I like to, like everybody, you want to be competitive and you want to stick with what's some things that you know that you're good at. So, I, yeah. I, hey, 60 minutes, this could be a um, before, before Mark game if we ever want to go over the top or do it again. I wonder if you and Donna would like it, but you know how with most bidding games, two-player no. bidding is boring. Yeah, you can't do yeah. that. I, we said that too. Two players wouldn't be as fun. Any bidding game is always more fun. With more people. Yeah, you have, and yeah. Up, up to five would be cool. Yeah, so. you would have to. Uh, yep. Yeah. Princess of Florence out now uh, from WizKids. Do you remember that game, Oh My Brains? Yes. Yes, from 25th Century Games. I have played yep. that game a ton lately with people who do not play card games. Oh, cool. And they have really enjoyed it. So I just wanted to do a quick shout out about the game and how quickly it plays and how easy it is to teach. So I just, you know, 25th century has been putting out a lot of these uh, games that may be under the radar, but oh my brains where you're sitting there and basically you're trying to play cards and you're trying to force people to have to spin their brains so that they draw more cards and whoever has the most brains at the end win when someone runs out of brains. And we've had a blast with that. So I appreciate you letting me borrow that from the uh, RDTN collection. And I've Oh, it's not borrow. It's yours now. I'm glad you're getting some use out of it. I just need to go get little plastic brains now and get rid of the little tokens. Um, I taught a scout uh, this mm. past weekend. Um, I, I play in the, the praise band at church and back in the green room in between services, sometimes I bring out games to play. And I love playing scout when, when, when you can see things start clicking in people's heads. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, oh, I have a set here in my hand, but I've got these cards in the middle that's blocking I want to get those out onto the table and get it so I can put my sets together. You see the wheels start turning in their heads. And that's what I so clever about the game. And it's so easy to teach. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally you could teach it in two minutes. I taught it really slowly. Like I didn't tell them the whole thing about when you have a set on the table and you can only pull from the at extreme ends. I didn't tell them the rule till we had at least three cards on the table. I said, pause FYI, you could pick any card you want as long as it's on the ends. And I went, Oh, that's different. So I went, yep. And it's like, how will we ever beat that? And I said, ah, how will we ever beat this set of four right here is because you're going to pick up a card. Then I'll pick up a card. There's only two cards left. That's a lot easier to beat then. Mm -hmm. Clever game. But yeah, I need to pick up Scout sometime. I don't know if based on some of the people I've played all my brains with, that, that may push them a little bit. Mm, but okay. but um, I, I think I could teach it uh, if if they're willing to just... I, I see the people moving the cards around because they are in such a habit of arranging their cards. And Oh yeah. And I'm like, don't touch, stop touching. It was like when we play, um, uh, Oh, Bonanza, mm -hmm. you got to take the cards from this side. You may not. And then I start seeing people trying to put their sets together. No, stop. <laughs> Oh. I, I will say uh, we're getting ready to go to Gen Con uh, last year. Oink games was there and it was a very popular booth. So we need to swing by there this year and see what they got. Yeah. And this time maybe you'll take me with you and I can buy it instead of you just sloughing off somewhere or whatever word I'm looking for there and doing it on your own. I can do that. <laughs> oh, all right. No, we got some exciting news. Uh, we've been with miniature market for many, many, many years, and they have now implemented something called an affiliate program. And we're one of the first ones to, to get into it. And what, what is this? 
it's basically it's a link that uh, you can use. It's going to be on our website. If you go to our website to the miniature market image, that's on our website, click on it. It's a special link to go to their site and you could just start buying things, ordering things, etc. But what's going to happen is, is it kind of helps out. our No, it kind of, it really does help out our show because we'll get 5% back on what you purchase. It doesn't cost you anything extra or anything like that. It's just simple affiliate link where you can support the show. So it's just a nice gesture that, Jester, gesture, gestures from the Princess of Florence <laughs> that you can have in order to help support the show. But it also helps Miniature Market know if we're doing any good for them <laughs> <laughs> because they can track the clicks and everything that the link uses. So I know typically when you go to check out, there'll be like a code that you enter in. That's not there. So it's actually a link. So if you wouldn't mind, bookmark our link. I don't want you to have to go to our website every time. Just bookmark our link for Miniature Market. And just when you even go in and looking around, just click the link. Even if you don't buy anything, they see those clicks and that really helps us out. Now, Tony, I did speak to him and I said, hey, is there any way once, once you kind of feel good about this, that if they click the link, they get something special? So, you know, uh, shipping is usually free after $100. We're tr I'm trying to see if we could do something where maybe if they click the link, maybe you only have to spend $75 or $80 to get the mm -hmm. free shipping. Like a bonus for you. Then there's an incentive for you as the consumer to click the link at that point in time. Right. Yeah, I mean, because other than that, what's going to force me to go help, help out these knuckleheads? Right, yeah. And it's it's just, if, if you're nice and want to help us out, you can. But we want to try to do something to where it's a benefit for you to do that too. Yes. And again, anything that we make, as always, goes right back into our show funds for funding the, the insanity, like making sure we have the latest and greatest Mountain Dews that we're getting ready to try over here, too. So, yeah, the, the link is going to uh, be it's on our Discord channel, and it's also on our homepage. And uh, if I can find some other places to put it, I'll, I'll do that, too. I'll put it always in the show notes. Thank you. So it'll always be in the show notes also. But remember also in our show notes, we have timestamps that go straight to a game. Unfortunately, that will bypass our link, but that's fine. If you want to go straight to see the game that we're talking about, do that, but then come back and click our link and go back. <laughs> well, so I've, you sh I wonder if that's possible to do. I mean, I, I'll admit, I have no idea how this web works. It just happens for me. So I'm sure there's a way that we could get some of our computer intelligent people to sit there and say, this is how you need to build the timestamps. And for me, when I do the timestamps, it's real simple because all I've got to do is put a link in the front of them and it'll just, boom, I just got to, yep. so who knows? They're smarter people, way smarter people than yep. me. We, we can generate a link to any page that we want. The question is, is do we want to generate a link for every single game that we ever cover? That's going to get a little bit crazy. That and is. I don't know how many links they'll allow us to get. So right now we have a link that goes to the main page. There's also another link I've generated that goes to our RDTN landing page, which shows all the latest games that we reviewed. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of cool. Oh, too. I could stop linking to the games and just linking to our affiliate and just say, y'all, y'all got, y'all know how to search when you get to manager market. <sighs> yeah, but uh, Hey, I like doing the how service. About this? How about this? Let us know, y'all. Do Are those links that go straight to the game of value to you? Do you like that? Or would it be okay if we use just our affiliate link and then from there you search for it? Come to our Discord channel, which you can also find on our homepage, and join. Let us know. We have an episode discussions there. And uh, just let us know what you think. Uh, do you use those timestamps uh, in the uh, in the uh in the show notes? Okay. And we've been talking for a while, and I am parched, so it is time for... Taste buds. Taste buds. Taste buds. Taste buds. Two incredible stuff. Taste buds. Two incredible stuff. All right, so these aren't necessarily new. It's um, they've been out for a little while, 
and but we, you and I haven't had a chance to do a taste bud segment. We have two new flavors of Mountain Dew to try out. Now, the first one we're going to try is Baja Passion Fruit Punch, and unfortunately, it is not zero sugar. So I will be taking a few sips, and that's probably all I'll be able to handle. Oh, come man up, dude! So you you got a can? I've got a bottle because I, I found it at a um, at the only way I've seen it is at Walmart in the bottles at the front. Mm-hmm. So that's so your sound effect of the can opening is going to be much better than mine. This was at a Walmart they were selling and by the case. Okay, I have yet to see them. My Walmart doesn't have what your Walmart does. It's a pretty can. It is. I see that. So, and I assume that this is going to be passion fruit. Do you like Baja Blast? Their flavor, Baja Blast. <sighs> I don't know. Okay, because I I think I think it's it's at Sam's, but I don't ever put Baja Blast to go eat my hot dog. Do you ever go eat at Taco Bell? No. Oh, that's a shame. Because they feature Baja Blast mm-hmm. there, and they have a zero sugar Baja Blast, which is really, really, really good. Okay. So no, I I, I haven't been to a Taco Bell in forever. Wow. I think we go once a week. The volcano menu's back. Hot and spicy burritos and tacos are back now. Okay. The volcano menu at Taco Bell. Dong. There's been, like you with your <laughs> other things, there's been too many incidences after eating at Taco Bell that I'm like, <laughs> I know myself. <laughs> oh, that's funny. The other night, have you ever eat, have you eaten at Dave's Hot Chicken here in Charlotte? No. Okay. Uh, there's one up at UNCC. And uh, we went and got it the other day. I did the Carolina Reaper one time. I'm like, I just wanted to see if I could do it. I did it. Never again. Don't need to. So this time I dropped down two levels from that. Whew. I was still hurting. You were still hurting? Okay. Well, mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's give this a taste. Here we go. All right. Here we go. You know, opening a nice bottle time. is just, it's not as good. That smells good. It smells purple. <laughs> Purple's a fruit. Purple's a fruit. Simpsons. Um, this reminds me of something. Well, how many different flavors can Mountain Dew to before they start all tasting the same? Which brings um, me to, and I don't know, I told you about it, but um, Red and Link, a bunch of alumni from NC State. By the way, Donna said if YouTube had existed when you and I were in school, we would be them. Because That's of, fair. And, but they just did all the Mountain Dew flavors and tasted in Spark 1. So, um, I don't know if they had this one. Mm. I'm not, it just tastes it's, like a, a very strong grape knee high to me. Yeah. It's very fruity. Not bad. It's just very fruity. I'm getting a little bit of an after, aftertaste though. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that's coming from. Yeah. Got a little, got a little bubble on the back, a little fizz. And a little, uh, uh-uh. I mean, uh, it's not one of my favorite. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, and maybe with it being full tilt sugar, it's it's a little strong. I'm thinking yeah. that's what it is. Strong is a good word. It is it is a little too strong for me. It's not a, a yeah. Hmm. Try it again. Mm-hmm. But I can't stop drinking it. I know. I know some people in the uh, our Discord channel have talked about it. Baja Passion. What's the other one we're trying on next episode? It is called Caribbean Splash. So this is going to be a blast of uh, natural and artificial guava flavor. Guano. Guava, not guano. It's not bat (laughs) doo-doo. Yeah, guava. (laughs) I've never had a guava. I haven't either. Maybe we need to try that sometime on the show. We can do that. And uh, have you, I need to bring you the Sprite 50th anniversary of the lemonade, lemonade. That they did. I need to bring that to you. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, I agree with you. This Mountain Dew, um, Passion Fruit Punch, maybe if it was in a zero, I'd enjoy it more. But it, yeah, it doesn't grab me like some in the past have done. Not like, what was it, Fruit Quake? Fruit Quake was just, ooh, that was good. But anyway, that's it for Taste Buds. The man over at GameToppersLLC.com. You know that guy. The guy who sells those really nice, nicely engineered game toppers to go on your table with the nice rails and everything like that. And they're expandable and they're a bunch of different sizes. And he has the nice place mat, play mats with all the accessories and the drink holders and everything. He sent an email today and said, guys, I want to help support your strike event at Gen Con. He said, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to donate a Game Topper coaster to every attendee. Ooh. He said everyone at the final round of the tables, which is going to be the, um, I guess, the uh, the final championships, each one of them is going to get a Game Topper game tote. Nice. They're like $25. You can find those over at GameToppersLLC.com if you want a nice little tote bag. Second place is going to get a 36 by 48 terrain green hex grid premium game mat Ooh. and a storage bag that's worth a hundred bucks. Wow. And if you want to see what these mats look like, just go over to GameToppersLLC.com. Again, they have a bunch of different size mats. We use a mat every week. Have a nice little uh, bag for it. Just to keep it in the back of my car. First place gets a hundred dollar Game Topper certificate. Good for anything in the store. Plus a Game Hall Game Topper bag for $59 value. All right. That's our buddy Berkey that's doing all this. He's setting it all up. He's not, he's, hey, this event's not going to be a shambles like I was thinking. No, no. Plus, I've had several people reach out to me. Some publishers going to be there said, hey, can we bring some games to give away? I went, yes, you can. <laughs> so we'll have a raffle. So don't put, don't forget the raffle tickets. Put that on your I list. Can do that. Well, uh, Berkey, thank you so much for doing that. Maybe if you listen to this and you can throw some um, uh, Happy Mouth Spices. I know that's your other side business, but I'm just throwing that out there. I need that. I need more happy. I'm out, actually. Mm -hmm. But that's not at hisgametopperllc.com. To find out about all of those game toppers and all the game mats, head over to that site right now. And if you're going to be at Gen Con, look for those game toppers because they're going to be used all over the place and especially to Arcane Wonders. Uh, those things have been through a lot of different cons and just look and see how well they hold up over at gametoppersllc.com. <music> So we got a game to the table at game night. If you will go over to our YouTube channel, you can actually see it. You can see some awesome footage, some B-roll, as Marty calls it, of us. You can hear me sing. I've been, I'm trying hard. I'm trying to get people who don't even watch our channel to thumb that bad boy up so you don't, you don't sing again. Yeah. The thing was, I have to get 50 likes on that video for me to never sing again. As of right now, we're at 17. I'm already warming up my vocal cords uh, for Thursday night. For Thursday. Well, go ahead. If you keep doing it, I'm sure people will come over there and do it. Anyway, Dawn of Ulos. I'm gonna, I believe that. Dawn of Ulos. U-L-O-S. Yeah, that's what Google's telling me in my ears right now. This was designed by Jason Lentz, publisher by uh, Thunderwork Games, and I'll go ahead and say this is best with the community at BGG says four. I would completely agree with that. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, four hundred percent. This is takes place in the role player universe that they have, which I need to play again, man. I haven't played in years. I need to get get that back to the table. So it's like they have this these series of games kind of taking place in the same universe. However, this game is nothing like role play. No, you're not rolling any dice here. You're not building any characters. You're not trying to do, you know, a bunch of strength stats and bring in on characters. No, you are character. Actually, you are the gods mm -hmm. forming the land. So the adventurers can battle one another. You are terraforming the land out there. And, and it's all about the battle. It's all about conflict. It's all, okay, it's nothing to do with that. It actually is not. So if you were to see this board, if you go and look at it, BGG, look at a picture of this board, this is a large hex board. Uh, that's incorrect. It's not the shape of a hex. It's a large board made up of hexes. <laughs> and every time you see hexes and maybe models on the board, you immediately think, oh, this is an area control game. Uh, it is somewhat is an area control game, but to me, Tony, and we'll explain why I think this, this is an economic game. I, I don't even know if it's an area control game because it's not. that is not your ultimate objective. You're not trying to control area. Areas help make you stronger, or well, not make you stronger, but make the character stronger. And by making them stronger, what are you really doing to make you think it's an economic game? Okay. You want me to go ahead and start? Go for it. I've got my pitch right here. All right. On your turn, uh, you're going to put down a, a tile. It's two hexes. It must cover the matching terrain of whatever's on the tile. When you start the game, uh, once, once, the, once you get a space set up on the board that's the same size of a faction's home base, 
that faction home base comes onto the board. They are now on that piece of territory. And every faction uh, is looking to expand their territory that includes different types of terrains. Maybe one wants mountains and plains. Maybe one wants deserts and, uh, and, and mountains. And what happens is, is that as your area grows, if, as if Tony comes in behind me and adds another little tile to that area where that faction I just placed like goblins, and it contains one of their terrains are looking for, the cards that they have that you can get for them become a little more powerful. When a faction comes on the board, you can buy cards. When the area that they're sitting on is small, those cards are cheap. As their area expands and their territory becomes more powerful, those cards get more expensive. But when you use those cards, they generate more resources for you and they themselves are more powerful. So what you want to try to do is buy faction cards cheaply when the area is small and then use them after the area has grown large, thus making it a stock game. And as the game continues over time, you look at what cards you have in your hand. You want their stock prices to be high because in-game scoring, how many cards you got of that type multiplied out gets you that amount of victory points at the end. I know they're not called victory points, but everything's victory points. So, yeah. And, yep. and, but how do we crash somebody? How do we make someone come down? Like I, I don't have those cards. Marty's got those cards and I need to drive his character's price down. I need to deflate his stock price. I need, I, I need to run on a market over there on him. How do I do that? Let's say, for example, I've got a ton of goblin cards in my hands and those cards and the strength of the goblins is very large now. They're sitting on an area of land that has a lot of their terrain types. And every time I play one of those cards, because on my turn, I must play a tile. Then I have a choice of buying a card of a faction that's on the board or using the card. Using the card can do different things. For example, it may say for every two strength of this faction and the more powerful they are, the higher strength they are. Let's say, for example, for every two strength and this strength is six. It says, hey, Tony, I'm going to look at three cards from your hand whichever one has the highest strength value of that faction, I just get those points immediately. So I want to, the bigger the strength, the more cards I get to look at, the better chance of me getting something. So that's an example of the powers that you use. So you either buy a card or use a card for the mm-hmm. power and you get the power value back in, in uh, victory points. So Tony's sitting there looking at me is going, I'm sick of this crap. Goblins are too powerful. I have some elves in my hand and it just so happens that elves land are really close to the goblins land. On his turn, he may say, I've got this piece of tile right here that I can join the elves and goblins together. As soon as they join, we go into conflict mode. And at this point, you're going to battle each of them against each other. Everybody at the table can contribute cards uh, to the battle to try to increase the strength of whichever faction they want. And whichever strength is the highest, they take over the land of the other one. The other one's taken off the board and their stock value go, drops to zero at that point. And it's so much fun watching that happen. It is so much fun. Because now my handful of goblins that were just racking points are all of a sudden now worth zilch until I can try and establish a goblin camp again. Yeah. And, and that's the hidden knowledge. We're seeing which cards you're buying. The mm-hmm. hidden knowledge is we don't know which tiles you have and if you're going to be able to connect lands. And, and you may know, you may have a plan. So some of the strategy is I want to do this and then cause these two to battle. And as the person who creates it, I decide who I want to be the victor. And we all get an opportunity to play cards down that will enhance the strength of the, uh, the people that are in combat. Mm-hmm. You don't have to actually play those cards. There's some bluffing. There's some, there's, yes. there's some bluffing going on here. Yeah, you could bluff. You could put down cards and say, oh, I'm playing a bunch of elves to help mm-hmm. out and I'm freaking out going, crap, I better play all my goblins. And you go, psych, it really wasn't the elves. It was the Sheiky. And I'm just going to put those right back in my hand. Mm-hmm. But you played the goblins and they're in the battle. So you got to get rid of half of them, round it up. But the nice thing is, is when you do get rid of them, you get their victory point values or their uh, uh, spoils. You, you get their spoils value, which is basically like uh, victory points for even just using those cards. So 
anytime that you use a card, whether it be for the ability or even in battle, you're probably going to get some points back. Mm -hmm. But by having played those cards, if even if you played the winner, you've now had to get rid of them. So it has also, this, this is tight. This is when I said, this is tight. Who is that from mm -hmm. Ryan George? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, we yeah, ha we haven't uh, used pitch, those in a while. Meeting. Yeah, pitch, pitch meetings. Pitch meetings, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, discarding cards is tight. It's tight because it helps drive what you want to do next or how you want to hurt other people. And it's not hurting them physically. It is just hurting their econ economics. Yeah. Remember, you're not playing as a faction. Mm -mm. You're supposedly a god that's kind of controlling what factions are in control. So I'm not the elves or the goblins. I just want to buy stock and sell stock, basically, of who's the most powerful in the land yeah. right now. I have vested interest in these. Yeah. And and then there's, when you start out, you always, the tiles have to be next to another tile. Is that? No, they have to be next to the rifts to start out. Yeah, you, you start next to a rift mm -hmm. tile. Oh, rift tile is another thing on the board that uh, if a rift tile ever gets uncovered because of a fight or you connect to an existing rift tile, you take it off the board and you look at it and it's a special ability. Mm -hmm. So you have these special abilities that you can use right. on your turn. Or victory points at the end of the game. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff going on and then, all right, so we've knocked people off the board. We fought them. They're now lost. Then you can bring them back onto the board as soon as their shapes match. And there's some other- The base of the, base. the, uh, mm -hmm. of the, the faction. Figure. Yeah. So they can- Oh, by the way, side note, production qualities freaking top notch in this game it's tight the miniatures are gorgeous it's thick thick cardboard pieces and tiles thunderworks went all out on production i love this what i love too is the faction camps have a nice figure in the middle of it of what it is and on either shot side it shows the terrain that they're actually looking for. So one has like little trees or little plateaus. And you guys said, it'd be really cool if I painted them. Yes, it would be. So it'd be easily distinguished because mm -hmm. the, the plains and the plateaus, you get kind of confused on well, the plateau has the little mountain hill where the plains are flat. So yeah, it would yeah. be nice if you would do that. It's not hard. Actually, I saw on Twitter, somebody, yeah, they uh, painted them. Well, they should. They actually did that. And so they, so the planes look different than, yeah. I mean, it, and it really did help. It really did. You could distinguish the mountains and the forest and everything. Anyway, production top, 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 top notch. As soon as you build an area on the board that can happen to fit the three hex base of that faction, you could just immediately put it on the board. And when you do, you get one of their cards too. And then everybody else is going to start buying those cards because they're dirt cheap at that point. Mm -hmm. And I bet that person also had their game punched before they showed up with the painted figures. <sighs> But, that, but it, uh, that's neither here nor there. It's just a, a, an observation I have. And But yeah, great game. Enjoyed the game. I, you know, I never felt like we, well, we did team up because somebody was really powerful. So we needed to do that. But you also question, well, maybe I don't want to hurt that because I, can, I know I've got that, the, the faction mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's where the bluffing comes in. And it's, it's just, it's a... If you like economic games, this is an excellent economic game. And that's what's so misleading about it. You look at it and it's like, how is this an economic game? And it strictly is as simple as possible. The faction cards are cheaper when the area that they're on is smaller and they're more expensive later on. But when you use them, they generate way more points. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you talked about, uh, I mentioned the example earlier hey, goblins are too big. I don't want Marty to win goblins. Maybe Bert goes, well, I got a bunch of goblins too. I don't want goblins to lose. And we end up kind of working together to make sure the elves don't take it over sort of deals too. And I like it too that if two factions just get way too powerful, one of the triggers at the end of the game is that they get all the way to the end of the uh, strength track. They flip over. If two of those flip over, the game stops. I like that because if there's two runaway factions, it'll just trigger the end of the game. Otherwise, the normal end of the game is when the draw pile of t tiles are out because you place a tile, you either buy a card or do an action on the card. The last thing you do is draw a new tile from the supply. Good game. Uh, well, like you said, it's on Kickstarter. If you're at Gen Con and they have them in the booth, really, really recommend. I know I'm considering picking up my own copy it's just one of those that I would like to try out with Donna because it does 
you got to get past that whole fault of battling. It's not really battling. It's, it's stock market. And she really enjoys the stock market games. So I, I'm very interested in, in seeing what uh, she would think about it. Okay. Yes. Kickstarters have already got their games. Gen Con release August 3rd. Retail released August 15th. So just in a couple weeks, it'll be readily available. Seriously, y'all, this is one of the more unique playing games I've played this year because what you see is not what the game really is. And I think that's just really clever. Five minute initiative begins in three, two, one. All right. I must admit, you know, those little chit games, those little war games with the little, uh, little tokens, with a lot of numbers. They intimidate me, Tony. So I'm always looking for like a game that maybe is easier to get into using those. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what 1212 Los Navas de Telosa is from Draco Ideas designer Pablo Sands. This is like a little small two player 30 to 45 minute game uh, that takes place in St Spain. 1212, one side is Christians, one side are Muslims. And basically the Christians are trying to come in and take out the Muslim stronghold and try to win the game. Meanwhile, the Muslims are just trying to thin out the Christians. And once they've thinned out enough of them, they can trigger and win the game. But this game is so straightforward and so easy to understand. But each side plays really differently. Yes, they do. And it is, that is the strength of the game. Because if you are Christians, you are limited in how you move. Where the Muslim side, you move different ways. And it's just like, okay, tactically, how can I take advantage of that on, on one side versus the other? Everybody plays a card simultaneously at the start, and that sets the initiative of the round. And whoever plays the highest gets to go first. And so tactically, you may say, you know what, I need to be able to react, or do I want to go on the offense this time? The game's going to be over in no time, so the Christians may have to push forward. So they've got to challenge this, or the Muslims may turtle. You don't know what that person's going to do. But I found, Marty, that for me in this game, that initiative was probably one of the hardest decisions I was having to make. To me, it reminds me of Undaunted. Mm. That tough decision of like, I've got this card in my hand that's really good, but it's a high initiative. That's exactly what you had here because there's only nine cards total. Mm -hmm. And each card has two numbers, one for Christian, one for Muslims. And they range anywhere from one to six. And those, that number is also the number of actions that you get on your turn. So if you give up a high number card, then that's less action points that you have to spend on your turn when it is your turn. And it's also very important because when you battle, you need to remember what's in the deck based on what cards slip over to determine strength. Each of you have three cards in your hand to start the round. You play each as initiative. So there's two left that you're going to play, but there's three cards left in the deck because when you do go into a conflict mode, uh, when a battle occurs, you're going to count up the strengths on these tokens and some of the uh, different tokens may have different abilities, uh, et cetera. And you're going to have one square target, another square. You add up the strengths. Then you flip over the top card of the deck. And then you add the Christian value to the Christian side, the Muslim value to the Muslim side. And the difference is the damage that the other side will take. Well, once that card goes into the discard pile, if we have two more conflicts, we just flip that deck over, which means we don't shuffle. Mm -hmm. So we know what the order of the cards are at that point. Also, I think it's important to point out that there are various soldiers on the field that impact what's going to happen in your actions. There's cavalry, which allow you to charge. Archers, which can thin the ranks. Determining damage, straightforward. I mean, I get to pick who I want to, but it's really, I mean, they're all, every, every little chit out there is only two strength. Two hit points. Two hit points, right. Yeah. So I, he gets hit. Flip him over to one. He gets hit again. He's off the board. He's not coming back. He's not going to the hospital. So straightforward, easy, fast playing little war game. Very strategic. Is it something new, something different? Not really, but it is quick. It's easy to play. And I think the asymmetry of the two sides is what really makes this a good game. Yeah. And literally on your turn, all you're going to do is like, if I have a four value, I may say, okay, I'm going to spend a point to move. I'm going to spend two points to fire. But the points that we spend between Christians and Muslims are different. The amount of mm -hmm. damage that they do is different. The board is really small. It's only three columns total. 
The setup, it tells you exactly where each, each token goes on the board at the setup of the game. The Christians will only move up and down the columns, but like, like you said, the Muslims can go back and forth to any column, so it makes a little bit of difference there. What's cool, Tony, I didn't realize, didn't realize this. There's a big award called the Charles S. Roberts Award, which is given out to historical and war games every year. This game was nominated for Best mm. Medieval War Game from 2022. So it's got some it's good accolades to it, and it's a very small box. It's pull out and play 30 minutes. I, I liked it. I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it as well. I like the fact that I'm not rolling dice. Easy setup, quick, very tactical, having to respond to the other player. That's what these games yep, are about. Exactly. And with this one, there's not so many little tokens on the board. You can use little, those little tweezers like you see a lot mm-hmm. of other war gamers use. So that is 1212 Las Navas de Tolosa, designer Pablo Sands and publisher Draco Ideas. Five minute initiative is complete. Tony, in 2017, you and I went to the CMON Expo down in Hotlanta, Georgia, where we got to play a brand new game from CMON called Ethnos. This was designer by Paulo Mori, and this is was an area control game. You had this, you had this little map, and you were putting your little pieces out on the board, and you played through three three rounds. And after each round, the person who was had the most pieces in each of the pieces of the map would get would get some points. But it's how you place those pieces on the board that are really unique was through set collection. We love the game. I remember, remember when we played with, uh, we played with uh, Dan King, the Game Boy Geek, played with some people from uh, Man vs. Meeple. It was a big hit for us that year. Mm-hmm. It was. And some of the strong parts about Athens was the fact that in the victory points in the areas that, that you're talking mm-hmm. about was random. Yep. It was random. And that, that's, that was one of the str- strengths of this game. Yep. Now, there were some people who didn't like some of the art. It was a fantasy-themed thing. They didn't think the card art was that great. And it kind of went away, and they never remade it. Well, this year, the same designer, working with Space Cowboys, announced Archaea Society with the idea that, hey, this is going to be like Ethnos. So I got super excited. We got a copy of the game, and we've played this game. So now, what I'm going to do is explain all the similarities between the two games, and then we'll discuss the differences, which is where I'm going to have some issues. Similarities are this. In each game, you had six different factions of cards, and each of those uh, decks of cards had six different colors. You'd shuffle all these things uh, together. Everybody was dealt one card. Then you put a mark out on the board, a uh, number of players plus two. On your turn, you either take a card from the market or draw one off the top of the deck, or play a set. A set is played like this. You can play any number of cards you want. They must all be matching faction or matching colors. And when you play the set, you're going to pick one of your cards to put on top. That is the leader, which means you can take the action of that card and the color will denote what color section of the board you'll be interacting with. That's all the similarities right there. Okay. So I didn't realize that Paulo had said that he was doing a re-implementation of Ethnos. I mean, it's what it says on BGG, so I think it's important for people to realize that don't always go by what you may read. All right, now let's talk about the differences. It's the main game board. Ethnos had a map. The map was broken into the different colors of the cards. When you played a set, if the size of your set exceeded the stack you had in that section of the map, Corresponding to the color of the lead card, you get to place another one of your pieces there. In this game, you have six different color boards that have scoring tracks on them. At the beginning of the game, each of you will put your player markers at the starting point of each of those colored boards. And in this game, when you play a set, the color of the card that's on top, if you exceed the limit of where your marker is, you can advance it to the next spot in that board. Oh, well, there is a similarity. Because in the bottom half of the deck, there are these three cards. In the first game, it was dragons. In this game, it's monkeys. When the third monkey is drawn, you immediately stop and you score the round. So basically, you go to each one of those little tracker boards and you get points based on where your marker is at that point. Contrast that with what Ethnos Ethnos was, was who had the biggest stack in each area? Whoever has the biggest stack gets that, that amount of points for that round based on those random tokens that came out. Right. And it wasn't until the end that, you know, all the victory points got scored at the end of the first round, the first victory points were scored. Whereas in this one, 
everybody's going to get victory points if they advanced on their various scoring boards. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's one of the other big, it's a big difference. I I understand when we played it and I've played it since we've played it. And I don't know where we go with this. If you're liking the competition for the areas, then you're not going to enjoy this game. Nope. I mean, if that was the sole driver behind Ethnos and you were like, well, I, it, the game, the re-implementation, I mean, we've already talked about Thunder Road Vendetta, and I said, you got to have the copters in there for me to fill, you know, to, to enjoy the game. If you don't like, if you want the area control in there, then you are not going to enjoy this game. Yeah, and somebody's going to correct this area majority, whatever oh, you want to call it. Just having, I know, but just whoever has the most pieces in the board. But to me, if somebody says, Marty, explain Ethnos, I'll go, oh, well, that's an area majority game where beginning pieces on the board is done through playing different sets of cards. And some of the, and so a lot of the abilities of the factions from Ethnos carried over to here. There was a faction that's like, hey, if this card's on top, you can treat it as any color, like a wild card. Uh, there was one that uh, helps you make the size of the stack increase, but it's not worth anything at the end of the round. You have to discard those cards. So a lot of the same abilities translated over to these cards. Same thing is also, there was another similarity. At the very end of the round, you're going to count all the sets that you made and you're going to score points based on those sets. So a set of two or three may score two points. A set of of five may score four points or et cetera. The bigger sets you made each round, the more points you score. Take all the cards, make a second deck. I mean, reshuffle everything together and go again and play for two more rounds. But to me, Tony, this went from a head-to-head battling over areas. Ooh, what is Tony trying to do? He just picked up a blue card. Does that mean he's going to try to take over the blue area, which I'm fighting for? Should I continue fighting for that or maybe go somewhere else? There was all that that's now gone that is strictly, to me, is just solitaire. This is a solitaire game. I don't disagree. Completely agree. I mean, when we played it again, and I played it with people who are not gamers, so I was kind of curious what their take is on it. Because I remi- Talk to me. Because I reminded them of Ethnos when we played it the last time. Because they had mm-hmm. they had played the original, but it's not, I mean, it's been six years. And they're like, uh, we, oh yeah, because I gave them the event that happened when the third dragon showed up and somebody lost all their cards they had been collecting and they got very angry and threw the cards across the table. Was that Donna? No, it was somebody else. Okay. No, no, okay. no, no, no. They liked it. They enjoyed it. But I noticed something. Okay. There was no catching the leader. There was no way to shift that, that dynamic when we were playing it. And the same thing happened in our game. I got so far out in head. There was no way y'all were going to catch me. Yeah. Yeah. Now each of the each of the faction boards are a little different. There are some that like every other space is like a value of zero, so you don't want that round to end on a zero point value. You want to get to the next space. Uh, the other sides of the boards, I don't know if you played with those. Mm-hmm. If you cross certain thresholds, you get a special ability. You get to do something mm-hmm. sort of thing, but there's not that intense fighting for certain areas of a board. It just Player interaction was very, very minimal. Yeah. And and in Ethnos, it was the ability to keep people from scoring points. That's what you were trying to do. Here, it, once they were scoring the points, there was no way for me to pull them back. And that is something that is different in this game. And so, well, for instance, in our game that we were playing, Donna decided, okay, I've moved up the tracks as far as I want to. She concentrated on just putting down large sets later. And that just kept her ahead of everybody else. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the rest of us were, you know, either moving up the tracks. And I decided in this game, I'm like, okay, clearly you do not concentrate on all the tracks. Right. You know, you, you, you need to pick the ones that you want to try to advance on if the cards come up for you. One of the things they did comment was, that the iconography at the bottom of these cards, because I got out Ethnos, and they said this was easier to understand than what Ethnos was saying with all the text on them. Really? Because that was an issue I had was the fact that the text was not on the cards. Okay, interesting. No, that, I mean, it was very, the, the iconography on it was, oh, what is this? Oh, it's very clear that this meant that you only needed one less to cross the threshold on the board. Oh, this one allows me to keep X number of cards in my hand when I play a set 
instead of having to discard everything. Or, oh, look, this one is saying that it's a, it can be played on, when I do this set, it can be on any board. They understood that iconography better than when I pull out, you know, the, the words that were describing the orcs or whoever in Ethnos. They, they, it was a lot easier. They didn't have to sit there and read a whole bunch of words. So they liked that. They enjoyed that um, change that there was. Okay. And I mean, you know, I'm looking at some of them like, you can place your marker on at any kingdom of the board. That's the Rhea wing folk from Ethnos. That mm-hmm. was the same as the other one we had. Right, right. Okay. So they've kept maybe some of the same powers. Right, yeah. Some of them were directly tied over. Yeah, mm-hmm. 100%. There was one. There was one that if you had it, it, it you you only you needed one less card in the stack mm-hmm. uh, than than the threshold. Uh, there was one that gave you a plus one at the end of the round when scoring. Right, uh, made the it made the stack like it was a plus one, so all that was yeah. there. Like the 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 elf, keep he- cards in your hand, draw X cards from the deck. The wizard, I don't think that was in there. I hadn't played all of the ones from Marcius Society, but I, but I agree with you that if the whole thing about Ethnos was the shifting of the area control or area majority and being able to battle for that is what made that game for you. Then this is not going to be Arceus society is not going to be a game for you. But if you like a clever set collection game where there's not a lot of player interaction or take that, then this might be something that you're interested in because the set collection part is kind of interesting. They did fix one thing. When the market is empty, you used to only draw one card. Now you get to draw two cards, which is nice because people would run into issue. It's like digging for that one card. Mm-hmm. Now you get to go through the deck quicker, which also brings the monkeys up quicker too, which will end the round. There is still a little bit of that stress of when is that third monkey going to come up, but it's not as much stress as if I just need one more piece to take over this one's area in order to get a lot of victory points this round. And then that third dragon came up in Ethanos. And some of the advanced boards, we we did play with one of the advanced boards. I didn't stress it by adding a bunch of advanced boards. Mm-hmm. And it it was, a I, I screwed it up. It was the very first one. And it was where you advance, you got to draw cards. But I could not find when that triggered in the rule book. But it was at the end of your turn. So I should have been your turn ends. Then you got to draw cards. Because other than that, you were drawing them to discard. So we, I messed that one up. But it really didn't impact the game that much. But yeah, they really enjoyed it. I would not... Oh, Ethnos? Yeah, that's... It's out of print. It's on my shelf. I will probably never get rid of it. I, I, I really enjoyed Ethnos when, it was, when we played it and it was out. Mm-hmm. I still do. And as far as this, if I have the right gaming group like I was, had the other night, I would do this one. I do not need a copy of this. Uh, I will not be getting rid of the Ethnos. I honestly thought I would because the art on this one's really cool. It looks nice. The production's really nice. But nope, Ethnos is the one I'm going to keep on my shelf. But now, decide for yourself. which You have now have two options out there. One's an area majority. One is not. But both of the set collection mechanisms are exactly the same. That's Arceus Society from Space Cowboys. Plays two to six players in 60 minutes. Out now. ShopPortalGames.com. Now, Ignacy was in the United States at Dice Tower East. And let me tell you, did he come visit us? No. No. Did he tell us he was coming? No. No. But he was down there and he was showing off Imperial Miner, Miners. Yeah. That's Imperial yeah. Settlers, Imperial Miners. I, that's a tongue twister for me, but most words in the English language are tongue twisters for me. Anyway, that is coming soon. Matter of fact, if you go out to shopportalgames.com and try to pre order it, it is sold out. It's not gone active yet. It's not gone active. I actually asked him about this because he posted, hey, you're going to be able to pre-order soon. I said, you've already sold out. And he went, no, it, it, you can't sell out. I mean, you can't get it yet. I said, well, then it, it's saying sold out on your website, but he didn't change that. It needs to make it pre-order. I, no, I agree. I'm just saying. Pre-order the soon. Pre-order, the pre-order page is there. You oh just my. can't pre-order yet. So even though it says sold out, it's not sold out. Just keep an eye out for it. But unfortunately, Portal Games will not be at Gen Con this year, but we will be. Wah, and we- wah, wah. We, and we can tell you all about what they have to offer at, over there. Or you can go over to their website at shopportalgames.com. Once again, some incredible prices on some of their classic games. I mean, 
Marty and I talk about Nirishima Hex. Somebody was asking me the, uh, on our Discord channel recently, you know, what's one of your favorite uh, Portal games? They were having a discussion over there. I think of all of them, Hex will always be one of my top games. I, I, I love yep. that game. Uh, Robinson Crusoe, 4350 over there on his website. Brazil, big hit from last Gen Con. Get over there and take a look at it at Shop Portal Games. And then, of course, all of the collections. Be sure to go check out all of he has to offer on his website. That is shopportalgames.com. And the next time he comes to town or to the United States, hopefully he will come visit Marty and I. But I don't know, based on his flight back, Marty, 30 hours. Yeah, I asked him, I kind of bothered him. I said, why don't you come see us? He said, I just didn't need an extra leg in order to get home. I said, totally understand after what you went through. That was a nightmare. Shopportalgames.com. Oh my gosh. Uh, like in a little over a week from the drop this episode, we're going to be in Indianapolis for Gen Con. Anxiety's already beginning. <laughs> we sold out our strike event. Oh crap. Uh, hold on. Email strike banquet. By the way, Spaghetti Factory, we are still coming. I'm on it. As you just heard in our previous Game Topper segment, Berkey is giving away a lot of stuff at our event. We He just emailed us today. Extremely generous of him. Everybody's going to be getting a dice tray for Miniature Market. And something exciting, everybody is going to be getting their own RDTN poker chip. Now, if you're on our Discord channel, you got to help design the poker chip, what color it was going to be, and what was going to be around the edges. Black ended up winning. So it is a black poker chip. But what's interesting, Tony, is there's two sides to this chip. We've only revealed one side because the other side has a brand new design that we're going to be coming out with that's going to be going to use for some merchandising. Why, why did you ask my opinion on the colors? If Let's just go to Discord for now on. You said black. You did like black. Yeah, but I was trying to go with some other colors, and I appreciate you. They're right. Black, <clears throat> black stood out, so we're definitely... I don't know what people are going to use this for unless they're going to be tossing them at one another. It's just a little token. I mean, it's just, it's just something nice. And going back to our, our new design, we worked with Ben Daniel, who if you follow him on Twitter, he does a lot of uh, board gaming art. We worked with him. He came up with the really cool designs for something that we're really excited about. And that will be debuting at uh, Gen Con. Mm -hmm. You know what it could be is, you know, there's these games when we did some rafting uh, recently and they were talking about a game they play called the egg game where you go up and you throw eggs at one another. This could be, yeah, I know how am I going to tie this in. This could be like the loser chip. If whoever gets stuck with the loser chip at the end of, say a quarter, they have to buy drinks. So our RDTN token can identify, uh, identify the loser of your gaming group who has to buy drinks at the end of a um, quarter or put some, some type of, I don't know, time frame on it. So like it's, it's never good to have our chip is what you're saying. It's kind of like our die that we used to make where we put our logo on the one side mm-hmm. and Mark Kale was telling us how he got so ticked off at us because he was using a bunch of our dice And when our logo would come up, people would get excited. He went, nope, that's the one. They went, who would put the logo on the one side? (laughs) We would. We would do that. So, yes, if you're carrying around an RDTN chip, and maybe that's just it. Whoever, it's like tag, you're it. Whoever's got this at the end is the loser at the end of the game. Maybe we'll do that at Gen Con, whoever comes up. I don't know. If you're not going to be at our strike tournament and you see us at Gen Con, just ask us. Each Tony and I will have some in our pocket. Oh, great. We'll just give you one. What? I'm, ca- I'm carrying around moon pies. I'm carrying around chips. I got this bag that'll be on my back, sloughing stuff around. Okay, fine. I still can't find the squirrel suit. Thank goodness. I know, because who knows going, who's going to win the strike tournament this year? I, I mean, and I need to talk to you about how we're going to set this up this year. We're not going to have the debacle we had last year where we had to convince people to go to one side or the other. That was the best part. No, we ain't doing that. They're going to, they're going to, we're going to. No, no. But that was the best part. People love that. The enticement. That's when Robinsberger jumped in and said, oh, let me help out here, baby. Yeah, but it, it, it threw the numbers. I mean, let's, let's, let's face facts. It, it was fraud. It balanced the numbers. I had five gladiators in the final thing, and I ended up losing because I, they got bald. Their, their loyalty was not worth anything. 
That's what we do with elections now. We just buy what we the votes that we want. Yeah, don't even get people started on that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but I, Gen Con, yeah. Do, am I am I ready for it? Not really. I haven't even thought the first thing about it, other than that uh, you got their tickets. And I, oh man, I got to talk to you about what time you're showing up. So you may be ringing the doorbell, waking me up. Oh my. Heaven. Oh my gosh, you're usually up by that time. You know, in today's world, not really. It's funny. So I, you may, you'll be my alarm clock. I'll be rolling out of the bed, throwing clothes on so you can, so we can get over to the airport. And you've confirmed our hotel. We're near the spaghetti factory. So hopefully we'll find some people to play games. Hey, if, if, if you see us and you want to throw a quick game on the table, go for it. I'm all, we're all up for it. Hey, if you got coin in your bag, Marty will sit down right then. Woo! I have a little bit, a little bit longer, and that's where the British way comes in, uh, which we'll be talking about uh, soon in the upcoming episodes. As soon as we try out some more, maybe a shorter coin game. I don't know about those longer ones. Yeah, I didn't sign up for any events again. I'm sure things are sold out, so we'll just be wandering around. We got one event. We're playing Star Wars Unlimited demo. Yes, we are. Yep. I, so, and just like in previous Gen Cons, each night we'll be recording a segment talking about some of the cool stuff we saw that day. Okay. I want, can I get a stand-in for that? My gosh. Well, maybe, we used to have stand we used to have stand-ins. We used to. We used to have other people on the show. And we might be able to do that as we're walking around now with all the fancy technology that's out there. That's right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up by just keep rolling dice and taking names. Hey everybody, don't forget to check out our website, RollDiceTechNames.com, for our affiliate link to Miniature Market. Just click it, bookmark it, use it. We'd really appreciate it. We also have our links there for our Discord channel and our social media, which is over at Dice and Names. It's going to be at Gen Con. We can't wait to see you. And if not, then we'll be coming to your ears on our next episode. Well, Marty, you thought you had me for 10, but it's looking like you got me for 20 years for this show. Ooh, why is that? Because based on what you pay me, it's going to take an additional 10 to get me to pay off my sprinkler system. Unless people go out to our affiliate link at miniaturemarket.com. Bazinga! Bazinga! <laughs>